Welcome to Chiropractic Science, where you get to hear interviews with leading chiropractic researchers from around the world. Hear about chiropractic research from the authors in plain English, not through the media, nor a middleman. My name is Dr. Dean Smith, and I am the host of Chiropractic Science. I am a clinical professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Health at Miami University, and I'm also a chiropractor in Eaton, Ohio. My research interests relate to understanding how chiropractic affects motor control and human performance. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing Dr. William Reed. But before we get to the interview, I wanted to thank all of you who have subscribed to Chiropractic Science, and I am especially appreciative to all of you who have contributed five-star reviews on iTunes. iTunes really helps others find out about chiropractic science. So if you like the show, please take a second and write a review. It will support chiropractors everywhere. Dr. Kelly Pearson writes, feeling excited again after almost 40 years in practice and now experiencing a bit of more free time with the COVID environment, I am taking the time to listen to your podcasts every day and I'm loving them. The data adds to the passion I have with my patients and I feel a greater sense of certainty about the value of the care I can provide. I've decided to write my first case study and only wish I had started decades ago. I am a listener for life. Thanks, Dr. Dean. Well, Thank you, Dr. Kelly Pearson, for your feedback and review, and I look forward to sharing your chiropractic science review on a future podcast episode. Well, the 2020 update of the chiropractic science slides presentation is available to educate your patients and your community about the benefits of chiropractic care. The slides are currently on sale, but as a bonus for listeners, you can take an extra $25 off by entering the code PODCAST25 at checkout. There are now over 365 slides in the presentation. Each slide includes a short evidence-based message from the scientific literature, along with the reference and a picture. In addition, you can customize the slides to your clinic. For more information and for slide reviews, check out our website at chiropracticscience.com. All right, on to the podcast. Well, let's get on with the interview with Dr. William Reed. Dr. Reed is Associate Professor in the School of Health Professions, Department of Physical Therapy at University of Alabama at Birmingham. He is the Director of the Mechanisms of Spinal Manual Therapy Laboratory. His research is directed towards determining the peripheral and central mechanisms of spinal manipulation and manual therapy for the treatment of musculoskeletal pain. He is the interim co-director of the PhD program in rehabilitation science at the University of Alabama at Birmingham also. Today, we plan on discussing some of Dr. Reed's research, starting with his introduction to research as a chiropractic student in 1994. Then we'll discuss his work with Dr. Joel Picard, his KO1 award topic, and progressing to his latest line of research on characterization of a rat low back pain model and spinal mobilization mechanism. Mechanisms. Dr. Reed, thanks so much for coming on the Chiropractic Science Podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, there's plenty of things uh, that I want to ask you about. And the, the first one, and I, I ask all of my guests this, how did you become interested in becoming a chiropractor? Well, I'm a second generation uh, doctor of chiropractic. So I grew up around uh, uh, chiropractic and I'm one of five uh, I have four other siblings, and uh, so chiropractic was always a part of, of our life, our childhood, growing up, uh, and, and you know we all uh, uh, got to go to, to dad's office uh, and, and, and ride the high-low uh, with there and, and watch him change. Uh, and back in the day, he graduated from 1963 from, uh, from Palmer uh, and, uh, and Davenport, and what... Um, what we enjoyed uh, is going, he changed the manual therapy, uh, the manual uh, tank, the uh, x-ray, x-ray developer tank. And so, you know, that was a weekend job. And so we hung out quite a bit at the office and you just became exposed to chiropractic uh, over there and comfortable with chiropractic. And you saw that we were very, very rarely sick, uh, didn't miss school uh, uh, and, and other kids, uh, you know, were, were out sick with the flu or our colds and and we just didn't seem to, to, to uh, actually come down uh, and get sick very often uh, with that. So I became very comfortable with chiropractic. Uh, and, and so as time progressed, I decided to make it a career. Well, that's fantastic. So you said uh, your, your sibling, did, did they go to chiropractic school as well? 
No, actually, I'm I'm the only one of the of the five. Oh, okay. Uh, with yeah. there, so but uh, yes, uh, we were all we we all uh, basically uh, were exposed to chiropractic, and and you know they had adjusted us throughout our throughout our lives. Actually, that's awesome, awesome. So, how did you uh, get involved in research as a chiropractic student, and then what ended up leading you to pursue the PhD? It was I think in the third trimester, maybe fourth, I can't recall uh, at Palmer. Uh, we had to take research methods, and I still think most uh, chiropractic programs have a research design or research methods class. Uh, and our task was to develop a study uh, that we would do, not that we would actually do the study, but we, we needed to, to, to do the research, the literature review, uh, to write up the, the study as if we were going to do it. Uh, and so I teamed up with a, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Scott Beavers, and we decided that we would, we would do a project. And we didn't want to do low back pain. Low back pain, even in the 90s, was like, well, everything's low back pain in chiropractic, and, 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 uh, and that's important. But we want to do something other than low back pain. And so we, we turned our attention to visceral uh, changes, and, and, and so we came up with uh, primary nocturnal enuresis uh, as a study. And one of the things that was appealing about this study, it had clear outcomes, basically wet nights or no wet nights. And, and so uh, it was a very... Uh, simple design, experimental design study, and that you're counting the number of wet nights. Uh, and so we uh, decided that we would actually do the project that we wrote up uh, as far as uh, part of our class. Uh, and so we went over to the research center uh, of the Farmer Institute at the time uh, and talked to Dr. Bahati, uh, who was the director. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, we proposed our, our project and, and, and uh, he, he listened and went through several uh, we went through several meetings with him, and you know, he said, "You all, you know, seem to be serious and excited, and you keep coming back. Uh, you know, uh, and anybody keeps coming back time after time. Uh, you know, is interested, and and we'll fund this study. Uh, so uh, we did. We, we got a study together, and uh, you know, we enrolled 57 uh, enuretic primary uh, enuretic children, uh, between five and 13, uh, and you know, we, we did a a 10 week period of chiropractic care uh, with a two-week uh, uh, baseline uh, and then a, a two-week period following up, measuring the number of wet nights. Uh, and what we found is something that we still deal with today is that we, we showed a trend when we compared the uh, control group to the treatment group. Uh, it was a p-value of 0.067, uh, but 25% of our, our, of our uh, children that received chiropractic care they had a greater than 50% reduction in wet nights, uh, and that was considered a, a clinical success. Uh, and, and so a fourth of the students that received chiropractic care uh, saw a dramatic uh, change in the number of wet nights, uh, and some saw a little bit of change, and others, we saw no change. Uh, and, and so what you had is subpopulations uh, uh, that were coming in and receiving care. Much like today, we have a hard time identifying the responders versus the non-responders. Um, but it was encouraging. It was exciting to see uh, with that. Uh, and we all, as clinicians, we all have stories that, that, uh, that would say uh, this person maybe had, had uh, uh, primary nocturnal enuresis and they responded, or this person had another kind of, uh, of condition that was visceral or non low back pain related, and they responded uh, to, to, to the chiropractic manipulation. Uh, and so, you know, you always wonder why. Why did 25% do really well? Uh, and some uh, of the children not respond at all. Uh, and so that's what was intriguing about the study. And, uh, you know, at the time, uh, it is a fairly large study for a student. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we attribute that to it. We didn't know what we didn't know. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was youth and exuberance uh, and excitement in getting the study done uh, with there. And we had good response from the community. Uh, and so we had a, a fairly decent study with uh, 46 uh, children completing the study uh, with that. Uh, and it still is cited today, even though uh, it's now going on almost 26 years, uh, we still see uh, citations regarding the study. Yeah, what I mean, and such a great uh, topic, uh, visceral topic. And like you say, I, I think some of us chiropractic researchers, you know, have... You know, when we look at the literature, we think, oh, there's a lot of pain-based 
uh, things out there. And so it'd be nice to investigate other things that really, uh, you know, people see in practice, like what you saw in your, in your own research as a student. Um, and it's just nice to, to be able to study the, the variety of, of things that chiropractors see in, in their practices. So, and you're right. What, uh, that's a pretty large study to, to do as a chiropractic student. I don't know how you did it, to be honest with you. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, uh, with that, we were kind of surprised that, you know, we were able to, to pull it off and, and it was close to, uh, to graduation. And we basically finished the, 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 the paper and basically graduated uh, very shortly thereafter. But yeah, it, it uh, you know, and, and we trial by fire or, or we, uh, you know, like I said, we, we, we were naive uh, with their, and what, if you don't know it, you can't do something, uh, you go ahead and, and you pursue it, uh, and it fell into place. Uh, we worked hard uh, and, uh, you know, and gained a great appreciation for the research uh, endeavor and all that's involved. Uh, but yes, I think even today, as I have students of my own now and graduate, graduate students, and their projects are not near the size uh, of 46 or, or enrolling 57 participants uh, with that. So yeah, it, it was a very um, a very large study for a student. Uh, and uh, but it was a lot of work. Still, they still all these studies are type uh, similar types of work. A lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of energy. Uh, and we had that at, at our, our, our you know pre chiropractic pre clinical stage in our lives. Fantastic. So I'm curious, did you spend any time in private practice before you continued on with your research career? Actually, I spent 14 years in private practice. Uh, and, and how that worked uh, is that when I, after I completed our interesa study, uh, I talked to Bill Meeker, uh, who, who uh, when I graduated, was the director of the, of the Palmer Institute. And I, you know, I said, you know, Dr. Meeker, I, I kind of like this research thing. It's kind of gotten a hold of me. I enjoy it. Uh, with that, uh, and, and what would I need to do to pursue a career uh, in research? And uh, he, he mentioned, well, you probably need to go back and get a PhD if you're really serious uh, about it. And said, so, well, you know, at the time we had uh, a newborn, a uh, one-year-old uh, son, uh, and I just graduated chiropractic college, uh, and we had the, the student loans and the debt. And said, so, well, okay, well, I'm going to start my practice and, and, and get, get my feet on the ground, and then I'll keep that in mind. Uh, and it was about five to six years later, uh, I, I started a solo practice. Uh, well, I enjoyed my father for the first six months. Uh, and uh, then we, we decided to move up the road eight miles uh, to a town uh, just up the road from him. Uh, and we began our own practice, a uh, freestanding practice, and we practiced there for four, uh, 14 years. So uh, the fifth year of my practice, I enrolled in a PhD program at University of Louisville, Anatomical Sciences and Neurobiology. Uh, and they allowed me, uh, I found a, uh, a mentor there, Dr. Magnuson, David Magnuson, and, and they allowed me to continue to work part-time uh, with their, my practice. Uh, however, since I was a solo practitioner, uh, the part-time was 40 hours a week. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and so, so that that's so uh, forty hours a week in the lab and forty hours a week in in, in practice uh, with there and uh, it took me a little longer to finish up doing it that way uh, with that but uh, uh, I graduated in two thousand five uh, with my PhD uh, uh, and so uh, I was fortunate that uh, you know sometimes it's it's hard to do that uh, uh, even today we have a couple part time students in our our current uh, program here at, at UAB. Uh, and it's a challenge. It's a, it's really a challenge to 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 do uh, 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 you know practice clinical practice as well as pursue a PhD. Uh, but that, we got it done uh, uh, with that. Uh, and um, like I said, if you're willing to put forth the effort, uh, uh, and that that never seems to be an issue. Uh, I've always worked hard uh, and long hours, and, and still do. Uh, and so as long as you have that drive and that motivation. And that willingness to put forth the time and effort that uh, you can accomplish, uh, you know, your goals and dreams. That's awesome. Yeah, I really, I'm really glad you mentioned that because uh, a lot of lis listeners, I think, are interested in pursuing a graduate degree and uh, doing chiropractic research. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and I'll ask you a pinpointed question a little bit later about that, too. Um, so I've got a better idea of how you got into research and your interests. Um, you've been published in... 
some of the top journals uh, in neuroscience, experimental brain research, spine, frontiers, and neuroscience, and JMPT, just to name a few. And we're going to discuss some of the papers that um, you've done over your career, and you talked about your study as a chiropractic student and how you got interested in research. Um, so I guess the the next question is, well, how did you go from the the bedwetting study to getting into the let's say the neurophysiology and the and the mechanical aspects of chiropractic research? What was it that got you keen on that? What we found and what we saw in 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 the in your research study uh, in the twenty five percent that had a dramatic reduction in the wet nights, it was I mean it was just phenomenal. Uh, one or two treatments, uh, and you saw the impact uh, with that uh, of the cessation of wetting at night. Uh, and so I knew that had to involve the central nervous system. I mean, uh, with that, to give one manipulation uh, or sometimes two, uh, and go from five or six nights of, of wet, wetting the bed to suddenly, you know, the, the parents were ecstatic uh, that they didn't have to change the sheets anymore, and, and they they treated you like you walked on water. Uh, for those that had 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 that type of response. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, the nervous system had to be involved. We had to change something uh, uh, in the nervous system, either biomechanically uh, or in the spinal cord and the circuitry itself. And so when I was looking at PhD topics and, and areas of focus, uh, I wanted to look at the neurophysiology and look at the central effects uh, uh, of chiropractic uh, and how manipulation impacted the neurons at, at the spinal cord level or, or higher up even. Uh, in the brain and or like thalamus areas uh, and so uh, that was my direction and so I, I we didn't have quite uh, at the University of Louisville uh, Dr. Magnuson's topic was the spinal cord injury uh, and of course that involved the spinal cord and, and contusing the spinal cord in, in, in a rat model and so I said well, okay that, that, that'll get me into the, the sphere uh, uh, of, of spinal cord uh, and recording and so we recorded from uh, nerve roots uh, in, in, in neonatal rat pups, and then and later my postdoc training, I recorded from thalamic neurons uh, and, and, and spinal cord injured rats, uh, and looking at responses to peripheral stimulation, mechanical stimulation of the hind paw, of the tail, of the trunk, of the ear, and, you, and you're recording these responses, uh, 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 these uh, electrophysiology or neuro neurophysiology responses uh, uh, to, to this mechanical stimulation. And so what I needed then is to uh, um, have a mechanism or a way to stimulate an animal uh, in a way that would simulate a, a chiropractic manipulation uh, with that. And so, I mean, we, we were using probes and, and uh, uh, to, to pinch and, and to, to a brush, a paintbrush to stroke uh, the animal's fur and getting recording responses. But what I wanted to do uh, is to, okay, simulate a manipulation and look at the responses there. Uh, and that's when, uh, after I did my postdoc at University of Louisville, I had the opportunity to jo join uh, Joel Bacar back at Palmer, back at, uh, at my alma mater. Uh, and uh, so I joined him uh, in 2008, uh, I believe, uh, and we started, he, he had the device uh, to uh, simulate a, a manipulation. And so it was a feedback motor, a computer-controlled feedback motor, uh, and that became pivotal, pivotal in our studies uh, with that uh, because this basic device allowed us to control the thrust duration, control the magnitude of the thrust, the location of the thrust, uh, and then we could go on from there. Uh, and that's kind of where I got the, 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 the direction of my uh, research career uh, is looking, wanted, wanting to pursue central effects uh, and then having a way to stimulate the, the periphery in a way that, that was similar to what you did uh, in clinical practice uh, and then look at the effects in, in different neurons at different levels. Uh, so that, that's how I transitioned uh, from a bedwetting study, a clinical study, uh, to a mechanistic uh, study of looking at what happens, what changes happens, what changed happened in those 25% responders uh, to our enuresa study that didn't happen in, in, in some of the other other children. And so that, that was the whole motivation and how, how I kind of decided upon looking at the neurophysiological effects of manipulation. That's awesome. 
I, I really like that. And a great segue to our next paper, which is uh, with Dr. Picard. And this is a paper that came out in Evidence-Based Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And it's entitled Relationship Between Biomechanical Characteristics of Manipulation and Neural Responses in an Animal Model. Can you tell us about uh, that paper um, and then maybe some of the takeaways in your own mind of, of what you learned and, and what you think can benefit the profession. Sure. What we were interested in basically uh, trying to, to determine uh, is what is the optimal biomechanical parameters uh, of a manipulation to optimize the neuro, neurophysiological responses, neural responses that you would elicit. Uh, and, and so that that took on the aspect that we wanted to look at, you know, how did thrust duration, how did thrust magnitude, or the amplitude of the, the, of the thrust, how did preload affect uh, thrust direction. And so we started a series of papers, Dr. Bacar, uh, with his uh, NIH grant, uh, uh, had a series of, of uh, elegant studies outlined here. And one of the first questions we asked uh, was, how, how did uh, thrust displacement uh, affect uh, neural spindle response, muscle spindle response. Uh, and for those unfamiliar with muscle spindles, and, and I wasn't that familiar uh, until until I started working with Dr. Picard, uh with there, but muscle spindles basically uh, lie parallel to extrafusal uh, uh, muscles uh, with there. And, and what happens is muscle spindles record changes in length uh, of muscle, and they also uh, uh, record or report changes uh, in, in the velocity of changes of length. And so I always picture if you take your, your two hands and you separate them oh by six inches and let's say you put a rubber band around your fingers and, and you just put enough tension on there to take the slack out of that rubber band and you hold them there. And then when you uh, spread your hands apart and stretch the rubber band, that's similar to what happens with a muscle spindle. Uh, and that, so you're having a length change as you, as you separate your two hands from each other, there's a, a change in length, and muscle spindles record that or report that to the central nervous system. It also d depends upon, uh, they also report how quick that change of length uh, takes place. So you either can stretch your fingers apart slowly or you can do it rapidly, uh, and spindles respond to, to, to that and report that back to the central nervous system. And so what we were uh, interested in in our first study was looking at, okay, if we give a one millimeter thrust uh, uh, displaced the vertebra one millimeter versus two millimeters versus three millimeters, how would that affect uh, the, the response of the muscle spindles? Because as you load the spine, the greater magnitudes, you would have greater stretch uh, of muscle spindles and you should have greater response from muscle spindles uh, that are located near the spinal, uh, the vertebra, uh, and paraspinal muscles. And so what we found is, sure enough, uh, with there, uh, that uh, as we, we had a graded response, uh, so we, 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 we displaced the vertebra one millimeter, uh, and typically in clinical practice it's been shown that uh, we, when we give a thrust into the spine, you're looking at a change of vertebral movement of between 0.5 and uh, two millimeters uh, of change of movement of the actual vertebra. So we, we basically, uh, by measuring changes at one millimeter, two millimeter, and three millimeter, we kind of encompass the range that would take place during an actual spinal manipulation. And so what we found is that we had a graded response uh, to muscle spindle discharge during the thrust, uh, and so that the three millimeter displacement had a larger uh, 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 magnitude of discharge uh, than, uh, than the one millimeter or two millimeter thrust. Uh, and what we uh, found as well is around 100 milliseconds, uh, there was a dramatic several-fold increase in discharge, uh, which is what's interesting about that is 100 to 150 milliseconds is the time typically that the thrust duration lasts in a clinical delivered spinal manipulation. And so if you just look at the thrust component, not, not the preload and not, not the prep, but uh, you just look at the thrust itself on their the actual thrust of most uh, uh, manually delivered uh, uh, chiropractic manipulations are between 100 to 150 milliseconds, definitely less than 200 milliseconds. And so what we saw was this inflection 
the, uh, this curvilinear uh, increase of discharge happening around 100 milliseconds or so, which we thought was interesting and, and maybe clinically significant because that is what uh, typically is, is delivered, uh, uh, the duration of thrust delivered manually. And so we also wanted to ask the question, what about force? Uh, does, does, do, we, do we see a similar response uh, when we give greater uh, force forces, thrust forces? And so what we did is we programmed the motor to deliver 25% body weight, 55% body weight, and 85% body weight uh, of, of felines or cats uh, with that that were anesthetized. And, and so what we did is we, we, we varied uh, uh, these different magnitudes uh, of, of thrust forces uh, and what we didn't find a graded response. It was a non-graded response, but what was interesting as well as even though we didn't have uh, a graded response there, meaning that the 25% body weight uh, sometimes elicited the same amount of discharge from a spindle as the 85% body weight, but what was consistent with the, the amplitude, the thrust displacement study was that the significance, the only significance we found were in thrust durations less than 150 milliseconds. So here you have two different types of control. One is displacement control, how much you're moving the vertebra, displacing the vertebra, and then you also have how much force you're applying or imparting into to the spinal, uh, the, the spinous process. Uh, and uh, both of them showed significant increases in spindle discharge at 100 to 150 milliseconds. Uh, even though there was no graded response with the thrust, for, uh, the thrust magnitude of the force, uh, with that, so that was interesting because, uh, as I said, it uh, it kind of tied into, okay, what's unique about the chiropractic manipulation, and and the big part of that is how quickly it's delivered. And if you recall back in our education, uh, I still have my speeder board, and if you remember, one of the first classes that we took in chiropractic technique uh, was practicing toggle and 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 the, the speed of the manipulation. And, and even uh, with diversified and things, getting that speed up. And uh, you know, far as muscle spindles are concerned on there, there seems to be a relationship there or a significance there at that 100 to 150 milliseconds. And so that was the study uh, on that. We, we went ahead and pursued other aspects uh, of, of, of biomechanical characteristics, uh, such as preload, uh, and it did turn out uh, on a preload that the, they had a greater spindle response during the, the thrust of the manipulation if you had a longer uh, preload, a four second versus a, a one second preload, but the changes were small uh, with that. And so uh, it did make an impact. We all have different, our own personal style of delivering chiropractic manipulation. And some have more force, some have greater preload, some have less preload. Some have longer duration lead up to the thrust, and other ones have a very short uh, duration preload. Uh, and so we looked at uh, the effects uh, of, of preload, uh, uh, and uh, what we found is uh, that uh, there, there was the longer duration of preload that you had, the four seconds you had a greater response uh, with that. Uh, and then uh, we, we looked at thrust direction uh, and whether or not if we thrusted P to A, posterior to anterior, or if we thrust it at a 30 degree cranial word direction, uh, or a 30 degree, or 15 degree cranial word, or 30 degree cranial word direction, or P to A, posterior to anterior direction, how did that affect the spindle response? They're again trying to uh, decipher uh, what is the optimal characteristics uh, to elicit the greatest neural response uh, in this one sensory receptor, just the, just the, the muscle spindle. Uh, even though when you give a, a manipulation, you, you, you're uh, stimulating numerous of different types of, of, of receptors, not just muscle spindles, but Golgi tendon organs and, and no seal receptors perhaps, and, and, and all kinds of, uh, of, of proscenium corpuscles and things that, that are in the sputanous tissue, in the muscle tissue, uh, in the, the ligaments or, or the connective tissue. And so uh, we only are getting a small window in, into uh, uh, this one sensory receptor, the muscle spindle, uh, but turns out that thrust direction did not impact the, 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 uh, um, uh, the, the spindle response during the thrust. Uh, and then we moved on, uh, and we'll, we'll get to contact point uh, with there. We, we asked, well, does contact point uh, uh, matter? Uh, with that, and that, that's another paper that we'll get to in, in a few minutes. Uh, but we also asked that question, how does 
contact, your, your, your uh, point of contact, side of contact, whether you're on the spinous process or the lamina, uh, or whether you, you're on the mammillary process or the transverse process, how, how, how does the site of delivery, how does that affect spindle response to the thrust uh, with that? So uh, we also investigated that aspect as well. Very good. Very good. Um, so I'm curious, uh, with all of that information, I mean, we can, we can talk to each other professionally, you know, about these sort of things. How, if, you know, if you're in practice today, seeing patients and knowing what you know, how would you describe those studies and the, and the significance and let's say as short of a way as you could and as quick of a manner as you could and, and still be somewhat accurate. <laughs> how would you, I know that's a tall task, but how would you go about trying to do that with a patient? Well, I, I think, you know, it's important to, to the, to convey to the patient that, uh, the, the, the adjustment or the manipulation is a unique stimulus and, and that you're eliciting a huge, uh, afferent response or a sensory response. And so you're basically, um, and the theory you know, still stands or still needs to be proven uh, that, that this is important. But if you have a barrage or a, a big change, a big increase uh, in afferent or sensory input uh, uh, at a certain location that shows dysfunction uh, with that and the changes that you are making uh, with that, how does how, that, that, and we, 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 we kind of, and we make a big leap, somehow the, the, this uh, mechanical input that we put into a certain area, particularly like so a painful area, let's say, uh, that, that they come in, typically a patient will come in with, with a physical complaint, whether it's low back pain, headaches, or neck pain, or something like that. Uh, and so you, you try to explain to the patient that we're going to put in the stimulus on there and it's going to make, have a, a, a change. Uh, and how we put in the stimulus, and what, what's on, on a professional level and not a patient level, what's intriguing is that you, you're getting change, different different changes of uh, sense, different levels or magnitudes of sensory input. I mean, a thrust is much different than a mobilization uh, or soft tissue uh, 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 type of work or massage type work. Uh, however, you, you're creating all, all the similarities of these type of different modalities and type of treatments is that you're creating a, 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 um, a huge uh, uh, level of sensory input coming into into the spinal cord and into the higher centers that it has to be processed the brain has to make sense of what's being done to it uh, uh, in the periphery uh, and so when you have this unique stimulus uh, such as a spinal manipulation over a very short duration 100 to 150 milliseconds on um, there you're making a change uh, at, at a level uh, not only at, at a biomechanical level in the joints we have a greater range of motion uh, but you're also making uh, an impact at a neuronal level, uh, not only at, at the reflex, the spinal cord area uh, with that, but also higher up in, 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 the, in the prefrontal cortex, uh, in the thalamus. You're having a, a, a convergence of all this afferent information that you're providing uh, and then basically watching for the response and how the body responds. Uh, so I, I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, it's very hard to kind of get in and to the Pacifics with a patient. But I do think on practitioner wise, uh, what we found is that, uh, you know, the thrust duration matters if you're looking at how much sensory input that, that you're creating. And so the, the, the shorter the duration of the thrust, the, the increase in muscle spindle, at least muscle spindle, uh, uh, I'll qualify, you know, that's one sensory uh, receptor that you're stimulating. But it, it does seem to to uh, have a, a, a several fold increase on the faster th restorations. And then when you look at, uh, you know, like activator or, or, the, or, or the Paul Star instruments and different types of mechanically assisted instruments that are being used in practice, uh, they have thrusts that are three to five milliseconds in duration. So that opens up another whole avenue. Uh, how, how does a manual manipulation at, at 100 to 150 millisecond thrust versus a mechanically delivered activator, Paul Star, different, the different devices that our profession uses on there at three to five milliseconds, how does that impact uh, the nervous system and create a, a response uh, at the central uh, as well as peripheral uh, levels? Uh, so these are questions that uh, 
uh, we're just now beginning to to explore uh, and uh, but we do uh, we're taught in, in in chiropractic in our training that you know how you deliver the manipulation does impact the response and sometimes the clinical outcomes whether or not muscle spindles uh, are directly related to clinical outcomes hasn't been shown yet and, and, and that's work that needs to be done but we do know that in this one receptor at least and, and, and as we look at other receptors we'll have a better more complete picture of how this unique stimulus actually translates into changes at the neuronal level. Yeah, fantastic. And I think you really explained that well. And, you know, the one big takeaway, and I heard you get pretty excited when you said it, is basically it's a unique sensory stimulus, and it seems to have an effect. I mean, right. that that's basically what I would uh, tell tell my patients uh, something similar to that. I don't know what actually comes out of my mouth but sometimes, but uh, something of that nature. Right. And, and honestly, uh, the patients know it too, right? I mean, they feel better. And that's even as a child, I mean, you feel and you got off the table, even today, I mean, you walk out of, out of the, the office and, and you know what change uh, has taken place uh, with that. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why that chiropractic ha has thrived and, and has has uh, maintained, uh, you know, and we're we're growing in the percent of the population that we're seeing. It's a slow growth, but we're growing, part, in part due because the patient themselves, the, the patient themselves, uh, also feels and senses a change. A change has taken place. Something has happened on there. We just need to be able to identify the populations uh, that that will respond. Uh, more so than the, those that maybe that won't respond, and then why are those responding, and how can we optimize our treatment intervention uh, so that more respond uh, uh, with that that come into our practice, uh, and that we have a higher success rate uh, because it's, it's it, you know there there's such a, a upside to not having to take ph pharmaceutical treatments in some of these conditions, muscle skeletal, skeletal conditions, uh, and, and that we can offer that uh, to, to our patients. Yeah, very well said. Well, let's get on to another paper of yours, which is, uh, it was published in Spine. It's called Paraspinal Muscle Spindle Response to Intervertebral Fixation and Segmental Thrust Level During Spinal Manipulation in an Animal Model. I wonder if you could uh, quick tell us about uh, that study and then and then your takeaways. All right. This this study, uh, and this was my uh, I had a KO award uh, under under the the uh, mentorship of Joel Picard, as I mentioned, and so I got an NIH grant in 2010. Uh, and, and and the topic of this NIH grant was using the same feline model. Uh, and what I wanted to do, since most patients come in and you you detect some kind of uh, dysfunction uh, uh, at a vertebral level, uh, restriction, fixation. Uh, you know, with something, and whether it's palpation, whether you know you use X-ray, different different types of instruments and tools that we use, uh, but we we come, we all as practitioners come to the conclusion that there is a dysfunction at a certain level that needs to be addressed with a with a with treatment, spinal manipulation, uh, and so what uh, uh, I wanted to do is is basically to, to simulate a, a fixation uh, at, at 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 the vertebral level. Uh, and I didn't want a full, I didn't, I didn't want a fusion. Uh, and the trick is, I mean, you know, it's not like a, uh, you want a surgical fusion where they put screws and, and bolts and, and plates and, and so there's no movement. That's not what happens in practice. You have a restriction or a, a limitation of motion, not a, a complete sensation of motion, not a, com a complete fusion. And so uh, we came up with the idea of, uh, of screwing the facet joint closed on one side. Uh, uh, with that, uh, and, and so I tried different screws uh, uh, with there, and that was a learning experience. And, and, and trying to get uh, you know different uh, different types of screws uh, in, into into the vertebra uh, while while you're recording from a muscle spindle uh, and not losing that recording uh, with there. But it turns out I went up to the University of Iowa uh, to the dental school, and, and I had a, a dentist, uh, a researcher there, I said you know you, know, you should use a dental implant screw. Uh, it's made to cut bone and, and go through bone, and, and, and with his assistance, his direction, he said, oh, hey, you, why don't you try this type of screw? Uh, so we, we switched over from different types of screws that we were trying to use, and we used a dental implant screw uh, that, that are used in humans. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we were able to basically, uh, with the assistance of a torque screwdriver, 
uh, insert a screw. And so what we did is that we uh, did a laminectomy and we cut the dorsal L, L6 dorsal root and we teased back the filaments. We, we had a, a monopolar electrode and, and we would uh, basically you're looking at uh, like it's a little smaller than a hair. And so if you take a human hair and you take this, this, uh, this filament, this, you tease this fiber and you wrap this filament around the electrode and then you, you apply your, your load or your manipulation to the spine uh, and, and you get recordings uh, with that uh, 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 neural recordings uh, during the thrust and afterwards uh, with that. So what we did is uh, we recorded in laminectomy only conditions, gave a series of five different thrusts at different durations. Uh, uh, we had a set magnitude of 55% body weight uh, and, and uh, we wanted to see the effect of duration uh, at different types of levels of, of fixation or mobility or restriction. Uh, and so after we did laminectomy, we gave the series of manipulations at different durations, and then we basically inserted the facet screw at, at the L5, L6 facet joint uh, with there. After then, basically, we inserted a second screw. Uh, it turns out that we, when we only fixed one facet joint, only one, uh, it had limited impact on the stiffness of the spine, the overall stiffness of the spine. And therefore, uh, we published a paper with one facet screw, but then uh, since we didn't have the consistency and the amount of, of stiffness that we wanted, we actually uh, fixated the facets of the L5 and L, L, L5, L6 facet, along with the L6, L7 facet, cats have seven vertebra, lumbar vertebra. And so we, we put two facet screws in, uh, with there and increase the stiffness uh, of the spine uh, uh, successfully. Uh, and so uh, what we found is that compared to the, the laminectomy only, which had the, the greater motion, uh, the, the facet fixated uh, uh, model with the, with the dental screws and the facet joints, uh, uh, the two screws, uh, it decreased the spinal discharge uh, during the thrust. Uh, and, and so uh, th that, that kind of the clinical aspect lets you know that when a patient has decreased range of motion uh, uh, and either through arthritis or, or through muscle spasm, uh, uh, that you want to get a, a, dec a decline or decrease in the spindle response uh, when you deliver a thrust uh, at, at the vertebral level uh, with there. And so uh, we also, in this preparation, uh, we went on to add a third screw uh, at L4, L5 on seven of our preparations, uh, and, and it turns out that, that as, as you go up the spine, uh, the flexibility of the spine increases, and so that third screw didn't have as big an impact as the first two on the stiffnesses uh, of the spine uh, with that. But we also we wanted to uh, determine the location, how, how impactful was thrusting. Uh, two segments away, uh, uh, so we gave thrust in, in all conditions, both the laminectomy and then the two screw and then the three screw conditions of the preparation. We gave thrust uh, at L4 and L6, and we compared the differences. Uh, and, and what we found, and this is what I find uh, really interesting, uh, because I think it has clinical implications. When we gave the thrust at L4, we, we, we were able, even though it was less than uh, what, what, what we, the, the spin, muscle spindle response that we received at L6, uh, with that we were able to get uh, uh, 60 to 80 uh, percent of, uh, of the same level of response from L6, the L6 level, the nerve root at L6 from an L4 adjustment. And so that goes to, talks to, or speaks to uh, the specificity issue. If you're, if you, uh, it's been shown that when you give a, a thrust, uh, oftentimes you're, <laughs> Your, your intended target, the time you deliver the thrust, you can migrate up to 10 millimeters away from your intended uh, vertebra. So technically, on some, uh, some instances, you can deliver a thrust and actually be a vertebra off. So if you wanted to be at L3, uh, you can give a thrust, and, and, and more often than not, you can migrate up and, and actually the, the majority of the thrust is actually entering at L2. Uh, so we, we wanted to see, okay, for two vertebra uh, uh, rostral or at L4, what type of impact does that have on, on the, the L6 neural response? Uh, and to see such up to 80% response being two segments away uh, uh, with that, uh, you know, it, 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 it speaks to the, the importance of specificity in that, okay, if you want optimal muscle spindle response, uh, 
uh, with that, you would thrust, uh, you thrust at the segment of, of, of dysfunction. Uh, but as I mentioned, and, and I failed to mention in our earlier study uh, on, on our different uh, sites, uh, was that we gave thrust at L6 and L7, and there was a significant decline in spindle response when you thrusted on L7, and you, and you uh, recorded from the L6 uh, nerve root. So here, in this particular study, we went two segments away, and yes, we saw a decline, a significant decline in spindle response. But as I said, what's intriguing is that if you can get 80% uh, uh, spindle response and yet be two segments away, uh, I think that may in part be responsible for some of the effects, clinical efficacy, that uh, you may not be on the right segment of dysfunction. We have a hard time identifying which segment sometimes. And when we give our thrust, we may be on the wrong segment uh, with that. And so, even if you're a segment or two even away from the area that you intend to be or would have the maximal impact, uh, Im- impact on there, you still elicit this, this, this gradient response uh, of spindle uh, 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 information coming into the, the spinal cord. And so uh, I used to think, you know, that, and, and as, as, as a, a Gonstead, uh, you know, I, I went to Gonstead Mount Horeb as a student several times, and, you know, and Palmer and BJ and, and, and specificity. Uh, and I think it does make a difference uh, as far as specificity goes. However, recognize that even if you're not as specific as you intended or wanted to or desired to be, um, that you're still having a large uh, sensory uh, impact, uh, sending a lot of information into, and that, that may have uh, positive clinical outcomes. Uh, and this is what I think we see in, in clinical practice. Uh, oftentimes, if you have a person with a hot low back, uh, maybe antalgic lean, and, and you can't really touch L5 because you know they're, they're very sensitive on there. But yet you you are able to adjust L3, for instance, uh, with there, and you come back the next day, tell them send them home, tell them to ice, and then you see them the next day, and they're better. Uh, and they think, okay, I didn't adjust the area uh, that had that had the most uh, signs of dysfunction L5 but I had a positive clinical outcome with that L3 adjustment that I was able to deliver. And, and I think in large part, this gradient of effect that you have uh, can be of a sufficient magnitude to actually have positive clinical outcomes. Yeah, well, you just answered all of the questions that I had about oh. this paper. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it, it was, you know, yeah, I know Dr. Charles Chuck Henderson, uh, uh, you know, he, he designed a fixation model, and it's very hard to, 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 to come up with a design that, that restricts motion uh, on a consistent level that, doesn't, uh, that, that you can reproduce. Uh, and, and so we did see a decline in, in, in the amount of spindle discharge because it, it makes sense if you think about it, right? So if you have a, a stiffer spine or less a, 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 a arthritic spine, uh, and you have osteophytes on your on your facet joints, and and the disc has deteriorated and and and, and it decreased in size, and so there's just less response. And you give the same thrust, the same magnitude, the same displacement on there. The actual physiological effect, due to the stiffness of the spine being increased, decreases the displacement, the muscle stretch, and the overall input. Uh, so uh, that that uh, I, I thought uh, what was exciting was that you could be two segments away. And, and still elicit uh, uh, a, a measurable response, and and I think that that uh, is 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 the first time, at least on a neurological level. Now they've shown an MRI uh, and and uh, an imaging that you know when you contact a certain vertebra, you get a a, a propagation wave that goes bidirectionally, and you have movement. Actually, if you contact uh, you know L L four, you're actually they, they they've actually measured and, and recorded. Uh, you know, movement uh, all the way throughout the lumbar spine, L1, L2, L3, 4, uh, and 5. And so you have this propagation biomechanically, but this was the first that I'm aware of uh, showing that you had this, this, this gradient, this neurosensory, this neurological gradient of, of neurological responses, uh, a neural response uh, in a graded fashion depending upon the location of your thrust and how close you were to, to, the, to the site of, of recording or to the, the target site, if you will. Yeah, and 
you know, I really like the idea of the the gradient of the effect. Uh, it it makes me think, you know, when you're talking about the uh, the stiffness and let's say um, osteoarthritic change that may happen, you may not get the the maximum neurophysiological response. But I wonder then, in in the patients who you know you continue with some treatment and and then they they start to you know get better with each adjustment. And uh, so maybe maybe we're engaging more of these unique uh, signaling characteristics after we get through a little bit of a phase of, you know, improving that stiffness and then engaging those receptors a little bit better as they get used to a little bit more stretch, for example. Right. Yes. No, I, I think that's very, very uh, accurate. And, and, and usually with spasm, uh, regardless of age, on there, when you had a patient in acute low back pain and you had the hypertonicity and the spasm on there, typically what I saw in my practice uh, on that is that you saw it's like an accordion. You saw the spasm get smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you settled in on a one or two segment area, L4, L5, let's say. However, on the first treatment on that, you had spasticity or hypertonicity all the way up to B12, L1, uh, and you see the paraspinal changes taking place. Uh, with that, so this fact that you know you 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 see this gradient of of a spinal response, and let's just say you had to have fifty percent uh, anything over fifty percent uh, excitation or uh, a, a increase of discharge of over fifty percent would have a a clinical impact uh, with that, uh, and and we don't know that there's such a threshold that exists, uh, but if it did, if there had to be a certain amount of of threshold reached or surpassed, and perhaps you don't get it on that first treatment, right, type thing, or the second treatment due to the spasm, and, and you do have decreased uh, uh, afferent input going in. Uh, uh, now, you, you're also, at the same time, you may have less spindle input, but you may have more nociceptor input, right, because they're in pain, and right. you're, thrust, you're thrust thrusting on, on a, a hot low back, and, and, and it's like, okay, well, you're exciting nociceptors a lot larger, so you're still creating uh, afferent input, sensory input, just of a different receptor uh, with that. But just on spindles-wise, uh, with that, you can see that, okay, hey, you can still have that impact uh, by being several segments away, even though, I mean, our data shows uh, and reveals that you get the biggest increase in spindle during the thrust, discharge during the thrust at the level of treatment, that the, that the force enters the spine uh, with that. So whatever, whatever you actually contact. Uh, now, we did show that there was no difference, and I failed to mention this. Uh, we, we looked at lamina contact, spinous contact, uh, and mammillary body contact on L6, and, then we, and we compared it to L7. Turns out, it didn't matter where we thrust it on the vertebra, whether it was the spinous process or the lamina or the mammillary body. There was no significant difference on the uh, the contact uh, location of the thrust. If as long as it was located on the same vertebra, L6, you only saw the decline in spindle discharge when you dropped down to L7 uh, or when you dropped down uh, two segments, went up two segments to L4. That's when you saw, saw the decline. So... The location of, of the entry of, 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 the, of the forces, if it's on that vertebra, anywhere on that vertebra, you're going to have uh, a, a very similar response uh, from the muscle spindles. Lamina ha did have a, a, a slightly larger, it wasn't significant, but did have a slightly larger uh, a, a discharge during the thrust. I think it had uh, an increase of like 104 impulses per second uh, uh, compared to, to, to 80 85, 86 uh, on, on the spinous process. Uh, so it very, very similar types of responses uh, as long as you were on a one particular vertebra. Uh, and we all know that when we contact uh, the spine, we're not just putting forces into one vertebra. Our intent may be that, but we're more likely uh, with our hyperthenar contact or our, our thumb contact uh, uh, with that we're probably uh, 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 affecting uh, two, two vertebra, if not uh, a three. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Well, let's, uh, go on to another study and this is a study published in manual therapy and it's neural responses to the mechanical characteristics of high velocity, low amplitude spinal manipulation. And this gets to our, our idea of specific contact site. 
Right, and this is what I had just mentioned, and I, and I got ahead of myself here uh, with there. So th this study here uh, addresses, okay, you know, does it matter uh, what we're taught is that, you know, if you contact a lamina, if you contact the spinous, and very few, at least in, in, in clinical practice, that you actually contact the spinous directly. Usually you, you, you kind of had a lamina contact, uh, if it's side posture or prone adjusting, that you thrust it directly uh, P to A, uh, posterior to anterior, on the, the spinous process itself. Uh, because it's sensitive, uh, 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 and so typically you're doing a lamellary contact or a, a lamina contact. Uh, and, and so uh, this work does show uh, that, uh, you know, th there's the same, uh, no significant difference in, in contact of, of the, the uh, contact site, L vertebra, L6 vertebra, when we, when we recorded from L6 nerve roots. Uh, but when we dropped down to L7, there was a, a significant decline in spinal response. Uh, but at the same time, you're still getting a fairly large response, even at L7, uh, 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 at one segment of the way. And, and so, uh, not to beat a dead horse, it just goes back uh, to reiterate what we said before, is that uh, the specificity may not be quite as, as important as we, as we once thought it was, uh, but it may be more important if we have a certain threshold that we have to succeed uh, with that. So if you are two segments off uh, uh, in your thrust uh, of the, the area that needed to, to be addressed on there, are you going to have, even though you get a 60 to 80% uh, discharge, a uh, similar response as of being on right on top of the area of dysfunction, uh, is that enough to have a clinical effect? And th those are the questions clinically that uh, hopefully our basic science studies will help, help inform. We need to, to measure uh, what, what were the forces that we're applying, and we're starting to see clinical studies come out now that are actually taking, uh, you know, it's, it, the, 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 the uh, effort to, to measure how much force they're delivering, where the force is actually entering the spine or the body uh, with that, and then, then you correlate that to clinical outcomes. The patients did better, the patient did worse, and, and that's one of the things that uh, 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 hopefully our work will help inform clinical studies uh, and then as we expand from muscle spindles to other types of receptors uh, that are also stimulated, other types of tissue that are also stimulated. Uh, but, uh, you know, just to think that you, you stimulate thousands of muscle spindles when you give an adjustment or manipulation. Uh, and, and so they're all reporting this information in, not to, not to think of the, the proscenium corpuscles and the nocile scepters and all this information coming in into the body in a very brief amount of time. Uh, with there, that it has to respond to, uh, and then have a a, a motor response or a, a, a reaction to, uh, with that, and then adjust or, or adjust is a good word to that that incoming input uh, in an appropriate manner. Uh, with that, so it goes back to what we said earlier. It's a unique type of stimulus that perhaps uh, other types uh, do not uh, duplicate. Yeah, perfect. Well, let's let's get into our our last article, and this is one that brings us up to some of your current research. And this is talking about spinal mobilization prevents uh, NGF. I'm assuming that's nerve growth factor induced trunk mechanical hyperalgesia and attenuates expression of CGRP. Can you tell us about this paper? Yes, uh, with there. Okay, so th this. Uh, goes back to, you know, instead of a fixation model, we want to develop a, a back pain model. And, and in basic science, most of the pain models uh, uh, that are available, whether it's carrageenan or, or whether it's their growth factor or whether it's uh, uh, um, capsaicin, they inject the hind paw, which is weight bearing and the animal is on, on, on what, putting weight on it. And so they hold it up and they, they, they kind of uh, protect that limb uh, with there. But there's very few trunk models of low back pain. And so uh, Ho Heisel, a group out of uh, 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 Europe, uh, in 2013 published a paper using nerve growth factor. And nerve growth, nerve growth factor has, has the neurotropin that the body produces, muscle, muscle tissue uh, produces, uh, among other things, uh, uh, nerve, nerve, nervous tissue as well. But uh, you have this, this endogenous uh, neurotropin uh, that basically... In times of injury, it's released and it creates an area of sensitivity or, or high mechanical hyperalgesia, uh, increased sensitivity. Uh, and so what we, we, we saw this model and we thought, okay, this may be a model that we can test 
the effects of spinal manipulation on by creating a little back pain instead of, instead of a peripheral extremity foot, foot related pain. Uh, and so we, we, we did a study and then we injected uh, 50 microliters of nerve gold factor uh, into the paraspinal muscles, the multifidus muscles of rats. Uh, and basically what happens is we gave them two injections, day zero and day five, uh, and there is a primary effect of the first injection and the second injection. You have uh, a, a, a response uh, uh, that, that creates a, a sensitivity or hypersensitivity uh, for at least two to three weeks uh, after, after the second injection on day five. Uh, and so that's enough time to, to basically implement a, a, a treatment regimen. And so we... We didn't go with spinal manipulation this time. Uh, I decided to go with uh, spinal mobilization, uh, as both have been shown to affect uh, uh, maybe through the same or perhaps through different uh, mechanisms. That's that's to be determined uh, with there. But it has clinical studies have shown that spinal mobilization also release, uh, uh, really relieves pain and 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 uh, uh, different uh, very similar to spinal manipulation. And so we gave the rat starting after. On day one, we gave them 12 days, 10 minutes of spinal mobilization. Uh, and so we had the, the motor that delivered the spinal manipulation. Basically, we just reprogrammed it to deliver basically uh, uh, for 10 minutes a, a mobilizing, uh, uh, it was 0.9 newtons of force. So basically 30% of the rat body weight. Uh, and we basically uh, did like 1.2 hertz stimulation for 10 minutes while they were under isoflooring. So we did have to anesthetize them to keep them still during this treatment. Uh, and what we found uh, was in this low back pain model that spinal mobilization 10 minutes a day was able to prevent this, this uh, uh, sequel of events uh, uh, that, that took place uh, to create this low back pain environment that NGF creates. Uh, and, and so that was exciting to see that if you have mechanical stimulation, and you, you, it, it's a, this was a preventative study, and if you basically apply the manipulation for a very short duration each day on there, it actually prevented the physiological aspects of NGF to create a hypersensitive low back uh, in these animals uh, with that. And you also saw changes in, in facial uh, pain, the mobilization, there's a, what's called a rat grimace scale. Uh, and so you basically record the animals, and, and, and there's a scoring of four, four different items for their facial expressions. Uh, and, and animals, just like we are, uh, we do, when we're in pain, they may have, they may have a squint uh, uh, or uh, a, a uh, well, the nose, the whiskers are pulled back. There's just certain four, four different things that they, they, they score. Uh, and we were able to show that uh, the mobilization also uh, prevented uh, this pain expression. Uh, from developing in, 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 our, in our rats that, that receives spinal mobilization. And so this is the first study uh, of, of, of its kind, basically using NGF and in combination with a manual therapy treatment uh, and, and to see an effect. Now, we, we, we also, okay, so we saw a behavioral effect. The animals, they had less pain expression and they had, uh, uh, they moved around more. Uh, and, and they had less sensitivity on their trunk when you applied mechanical stimulation to the trunk. But we also wanted to look at mechanisms of why that was happening. Uh, why, did they, why did they feel better? Uh, and, and so we looked at CGRP, uh, which is a, a neuropeptide. It's a calcitonin uh, gene-related peptide, and, and it's a peptide that's produced and associated with pain. Uh, and so you see an increase, and everyone in, someone's in pain, uh, you see an increase in this neuropeptide. Uh, and so we wanted to see perhaps uh, the level of, of production uh, of, of this neuropeptide would decline. Perhaps that's what mobilization is doing, is that you're seeing a, a decline in the expression of CGRP at, at, the, at the dorsal root ganglion level uh, or at the spinal cord level. We haven't looked at the spinal cord. They're actually we're just now uh, cutting our tissue uh, of the spinal cord to see uh, if, if, if we, we could look at changes in the dorsal horn as well. But in the, in the DRG, this paper deals with uh, dorsal root ganglion, uh, we, we were able to see the NGF created an increase in CGRP at the uh, upper lumbar uh, segments uh, that, that, that innervate the L5 uh, area of the rat. Uh, and then the mobilization treatment uh, actually prevented the CGRP 
the increase of CGRP from being being expressed. And so this is not the the, the mechanism. It's probably a mechanism or one way, perhaps. I mean, we were doing more work. Uh, these were this, this ex, these experiments were, were in female rats. Uh, previous experiments were done in all male rats uh, from the the group in Europe. Uh, Holheisel and, and, and his and the colleagues uh, they used all male rats, and so we wanted to look at the changes in female rats. And it turns out there are some sex related differences, uh, and at least uh, and, and there's been papers uh, showing that the, you know that there is a higher utilization of chiropractic and spinal manipulation in the female population for various reasons uh, with that, uh, and they have a higher level of pain often, or at least reported in, in the literature. And so we started off with the female rats, and now we're moving into the male rats and looking at changes in the spinal cord as well. But the whole thing is goes back to the, the question that we started out with in 1994. It's like you, you, get, you give a spinal manipulation, you cause a, a change uh, at the central level or at the peripheral level, as in this case the DRG on there. How does that translate into I feel better? Uh, the pain has gone away. Uh, and this may be, this was early intervention. Like I said, we started at day one, uh, and we just uh, completed the data collection. Haven't looked, analyzed the data, but uh, we, we allowed the pain to, to manifest. So we, we delayed treatment until day 10. Uh, and, and so now uh, we're going to see if mobilization can reverse the pain. As opposed to prevent the pain from developing, can we allow the pain to develop? Because most patients come to your practice, they're already in acute pain. You ask them how long it's been there, they say a week. Uh, I couldn't sleep anymore. I need to do something uh, to get out of the pain. Uh, I can't work, that type of thing. And so on our model, we're going to allow allowing the pain to fully manifest and then start the treatment. Uh, and that, that's, that's being done currently as we speak. Wow, that's awesome. And I'll have to have you back on if you're interested in a, in a few years so we can talk about all the updates. Right. This is yes. fantastic. I, fantastic. I'd love, I, I love to come back. And it does, it's a slow process. I mean, this study here with the DRGs and, and things, uh, about two years is what it took uh, to, to time you did the, 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 the uh, beginning to end. And so these studies do take a long time uh, with that. Uh, and uh, uh, And that's something, you know, uh, we, we fail to recognize when you read clinical uh, uh, trials, and you read literature, scientific literature, the amount of time sometimes that are involved in these studies, often two, three, four years go by before you have an answer to a question that you ask uh, with there. But it's exciting to see um, that, uh, you know, you, you get a positive response and to see that, okay, it's doing something, and this may be one mechanism of how clinical care helps people feel better. Yeah, and it's and you know I think one of the draws of being a, a researcher, and I'm sure you feel this way as well, is that you know you get to contribute in ways that you know people haven't studied this before. So it's pretty cool. Right. Yes. I mean that it is. Uh, uh, with that, I have a lot of questions. Every every time you answer a question, you have three more to answer. Uh, with that, so you do get to choose. Like you know what you inject, where you inject. Uh, uh, you know, is this a good model? We're, we're looking at, at at a different. Uh, we want to compare the, the NGF model. Uh, so CFA uh, uh, with that complete uh, Freud's uh, adjuvant is another commonly used uh, 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 inflammatory type pain. Uh, and so uh, we, we have ideas on, on looking at uh, creating uh, a different type of inflammation, a more severe inflammation uh, than NGF. NGF creates pain, but it's not quite the level that, uh, that CFA does. And, and so, uh, you know, you're always asking questions and saying, how can you modify? How can we find out more uh, with that? Uh, and, you know, we have the brains and spinal cords of these animals uh, in, the, in the minus 80 freezer uh, with there. And we're hoping to see changes not only at the DRG level, but actually in the cord and actually perhaps in the thalamus level. And are we affecting, you know, cortical changes? And how are we affecting cortical changes? Uh, and that's what basic science allows us to do. Uh, we can remove the tissue and we can, you know, stain the tissue and we can evaluate the receptors uh, that we can't, just can't do in clinical, clinical work. And so that's one advantage. Uh, but then again, the disadvantage is we can't necessarily say that that is directly related to a clinical outcome. Uh, with that, we can say it changes, physiologically it changes, uh, and mobilization, spinal manipulation uh, uh, does, does that. And uh, I noticed in our previous conversation, uh, some correspondence that we had, you had mentioned whether or not mobilization and manipulation, if you combine the two, and that's a very interesting study. I don't know if I, I recall a study in that patients received both 
types of, uh, of interventions, both a mobilization and a manipulation, because they are stimulating different types of receptors, as we just talked about, uh, with that uh, mobilization doesn't, they stimulate muscle spindles, but not in the way that um, a 100 millisecond thrust does. Uh, you don't have near the increased uh, uh, of spindle discharge that you get in a short, quick thrust uh, with that. And is that and how important is that uh, to, to the overall outcomes? But uh, combining those two interventions uh, in, our, in our models of back pain will be very interesting. That's something that, you know, in the future that we may also pursue uh, to see if there's an additive or cumulative effect uh, and by adding two types of manual therapy interventions that we, we commonly use and commonly see positive effects. Yeah, uh, for sure. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I think, well, I don't know what the, you know, percentage would be, uh, but my guess is a lot of practitioners would involve, you know, a little bit of both uh, on a per patient visit, um, you know, experience. Uh, I, I don't know. That would be interesting to, you know, to find out what percentage of each, you know, the individual practitioner would would include. It was just a question that I had because I, I tend to include uh, a, a bit of both on on a visit for right. for my own patients. And and and, and I did too. I, mean, I, I had a, a a flexion distraction table uh, with that 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 my patients, uh, in addition to a HVLA or high velocity manipulation, uh, oftentimes that they would uh, they, they would get a, a treatment on the flexion distraction table, uh, especially in, in acute low back or disc related pain. Uh, with that, that, that I found that that type of stimulation actually was very beneficial. Uh, and so you, you are right, but as far as clinical studies, I, I don't know if they actually measured. We do, we do a lot of things. We do soft tissue uh, and, and, and prep work. I know uh, I did a lot of uh, uh, Nemo type of, or soft tissue uh, work before I gave my thrust to relax the muscle uh, with that. Uh, and, and so, I mean, uh, and that's the partly difference between clinical and research too. So like sometimes you've got to narrow down to do exactly the same thing on exactly the, the, every time. Right. Not, not right. mix mix and match. Well, I had this patient yep. I did this and that patient I did that. And it's like, okay, well, what, what what was the benefit or how much each component actually add to the cumulative effect? Uh, but the similarities are that you are stimulating, you are creating the amount of afferent input, uh, and, and the receptors are. I mean, you you, know, you are stimulating receptors at every level of tissue, cutaneous level, subcutaneous level, muscle, bone, uh, with that ner nerve root are being stimulated uh, at that disc, the thrust we, we recorded uh, in these models, and we, we'll talk about it at a time, it's in the literature, well actually it's, it's not in the literature yet, it's being written up, uh, that we recorded from the disc during the thrust uh, with that, and these were using activator instruments, uh, and, and we, were, we were able to measure the amount of force that the uh, 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 the instrument um, delivered to the disc uh, 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 of uh, and about three cat preparations we were able to get, get data on uh, and, and we're writing that up uh, currently as we speak uh, and hopefully that'll be out in the next six months or so uh, in the literature uh, that uh, you know we're in the, we're seeing that your thrust has impact at every level every tissue level and all the sensory uh, receptors at each level uh, with there and and it's it's a big puzzle. But it's exciting and, and, and opens the door to a lot more uh, research that needs to be done to put the pieces together and see the whole picture. Absolutely. And, and I think this is a good time then, since you're talking about research and opening things up and trying to do more of it. One of the goals of this podcast is to motivate and assist practitioners and students alike to pursue research careers in chiropractic science. And, you know, it could be human-based or animal-based or a combination. Can you offer any advice to aspiring chiropractors or students who wish to become scientists or researchers? I think what I would recommend is definitely become a, a, a avid uh, consumer of the literature. You, you know, honestly, whether, you know, you want to get how involved in research you actually want to get. But I think as a practitioner, I mean, you, uh, there is so much that you can do for your patients by having read the literature and understanding what what uh, procedures that they're, you know, the set injections and, 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 and whether, how, what percent actually have an impact. And when you're informed and you're knowledgeable that, hey, there's a very low percent that that, 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 that corticosteroid injection in that facet joint will actually have an outcome or that back surgery or that, that, that fusion. And, and, and you're informed with the, the literature and the knowledge, not to say that they're not called for, 
I mean, I had patients that definitely it was uh, clinically called for, but you also, you see in your practices that you, know, you, you see a failed back surgery or you see a facet injection that had little to no effect. And then and you have papers that say, yes, this is not a very effective procedure for, 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 uh, uh, for low back pain, uh, yet it's done over and over again. It, it informs you uh, with that. Now, as far as getting involved in research, other than just being a reader and, and, and informed, uh, I, I would encourage you uh, or any student interested uh, to, to look at avenues uh, and contribute, uh, depending upon your age and, 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 and your, your other responsibilities and family and, and practice and things like that. Uh, the, the drive has to be there. I will say uh, what you will find co a common goal, a common commonality and, and those that have a clinical degree and then go back and get a PhD is that there, there's a lot of drive, there's a lot of motivation. You're a self-motivator, a self-starter uh, uh, with that, uh, and, and that it, it grabs you. It almost like it picks you. If you get excited about reading a paper, uh, and it's like, man, you know, that's exciting, or that, that that's informative, or that's this and there, and it actually encourages you to read more, to find out more, that's a good indication that research, it, it, you have a a a, uh, uh, a good fit, uh, and that it almost selects you, uh, and then you can look to see how, I, you know, if you have a state university, uh, I would look up the individuals that are doing research, and it may not be chiropractic-related research, but, it, you know, like I said, I started out with spinal cord injury in rats with a objective of, uh, hey, I want to go here, uh, but even just learning how the, the spinal cord and the inner neurons and, and how a response is, you know, a pinch, how they, they stimulate neurons in, 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 in the brain, uh, with that, those things were valuable, and they still are. Uh, uh, and so, and it comes full circle. So, I would encourage them to, to. I mean, anybody, if you get a call, I'm sure you, Dean, if you get a call and someone, a practitioner, wants to swing by and just talk to you uh, uh, about practice or talk about research or some studies that you may have done or been involved with on there, and and it all starts with actually relationships, I think, uh, and, and building relationships, and that sprouts into. Uh, 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 being on projects or having questions answered or even stimulates if you're not even doing the research. Like I said, you know, I, I really wasn't thinking about combining the two in our model until you had mentioned, like, well, hey, you know, I wonder if you have a combined effect. And so just that conversation gives somebody in the position that's doing the research to say, hey, you know, we can ask that question. If you have a question on anuresis, we can ask that question uh, with that. Uh, and, and you can contribute to science and in a very meaningful way uh, without actually doing the work yourself. Uh, but if you do want to do research, I do think and submit grants, a PhD, uh, uh, going back to what Dr. Uh, um, uh, um, Meeker, William Meeker, told me, if you're serious about getting in research full time, uh, you know, be looking at programs and PhD training, uh, and that's where it starts. Clinical or basic science, that's, that's where it starts if you are going to have a career change, and I will say, you know, I did it both, practice and research, and I'm, you're, you are riding two horses, and so after seven years, I had to choose a horse. Uh, they were diverging, and the, the amount of time required to do research is immense. Uh, the amount of time to have a successful practice uh, increases, especially if you see a decline in reimbursement every year or every two years, the, the, the decreasing reimbursement takes more and more energy to maintain your, your income and your practice uh, with that, the health of your practice. And so it does become, you know, at some point you'll have to make a decision uh, on which, which horse to ride uh, with that. And for me, I, I chose the research direction uh, as opposed to, to the clinical uh, one. Uh, and so, but even if you stay in the clinical, you still can contribute and, and, and inform your patients and, and actually participate in the research process. Well, that's, that was excellent. Uh, Dr. Reed, I've really enjoyed this conversation. It just uh, opened up my mind uh, to, to a lot of things I don't typically think about throughout the day. And uh, I really like your clinical examples uh, that you gave because uh, they, were, they were spot on with, with what I see in practice. And I'm only uh, 
practicing part-time because uh, I'm trying to still ride those two horses. <laughs> so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand 100%. Uh, but, uh, and it takes its toll, but no, you, and, and honestly, I will say, I, I, you know, your, your podcast, and I've listened to a few uh, uh, here in the last uh, week or so uh, on there, and I mean, take advantage. I went to Rack, and I was in practice uh, I went to RAC three through uh, RAC stands for Research Agenda Conference, and and now it's it's ACC RAC now uh, with that. And, and uh, but you know as as a as a a fuel, I went to RAC three, four, five, six, I think it was uh, with that, and that was our vacation. My family vacation was going to RAC conferences, uh, ACC RAC conferences, with my wife uh, with that, just to have that 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 motivation and get excited. But listen to listening to your podcast does the same thing. I mean, if, if you enjoy and you benefit and you grow uh, and it turns you to literature, I'll read that paper. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go ask my, my, my alma mater library to send me that paper. Most of these are free. A lot of them are free access now uh, that you can get to download them yourself. Some of them are not, but a lot of them are. Uh, honestly, uh, it, it, it is something uh, that uh, can motivate you and, and it, it, it freshens and stimulates the mind. Sometimes in practice, this is what I found, is that, you know, it's headaches and low back pain, sciatica, uh, and, and, and you help patients and you enjoy the interaction with patients, but it's, it's kind of, uh, you're, you, you, without going into the literature and stuff, you kind of become kind of stale in, in your mental outlook. And, and by getting in the literature and finding out what's being done, what's being found, and the best ways to treat, and even if it's medical treatment on there, you're learning uh, how to benefit your patients and inform your patients, and they'll appreciate that. Uh, 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 they'll love you for it. Uh, they come in and bring you their MRIs and, and their MRI reports and, and say, what does this mean, you know, uh, with their, and, and what, they're going to do this, this, and this, and is, is that, you know, what does that mean? And, and so you become a very excellent resource and an informed resource for your patients. Oh, yeah, very very good. Oh, I love it. I don't want to stop the conversation, but I guess we have to at some point. <laughs> well, you, so, you, you can come back again another time. Like I said, give me four or five years uh, on there and I'll be glad to come back and hopefully we'll have some more work done uh, uh, with that uh, over that time. That sounds awesome. Thanks again, Dr. Reed. You're welcome. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Chiropractic Science with Dr. William Reed. I had a blast in this interview, learned a lot. I hope you did too, and I look forward to the next interview on Chiropractic Science.